point. So thank you, thank you very much. I would love to comment on many of the themes that have been raised, but there's not enough time. I also am here to condemn the alternative media in their present form. They are pro-war and they are pro-austerity. Because if you come out and say we need a carbon tax, you're talking about taxing working people, and you're talking about a regressive tax on working people. So we've had enough of an elitist, oligarchical, pro-war, pro-austerity, anti-worker uh, media with no connections to actual struggles. That's where we're happy to have somebody like Reverend Pinckney, which was this tremendous effort to try to reverse creeping fascism, in my view, in this huge uh, and important state of Michigan. So I'm going to try to get enough time for Reverend Pinckney to I'm sorry Mr. Credico left. I would have wanted to uh, develop a critique of his economic guru, uh, Richard Wolff, and his Yugoslav school of economics. Because the, what he calls autogestion or self-management or something, that is the, the uh, Yugoslav model. And this did not end very well, did it? You, you do that stuff for 30 or 40 years, then you get bloodbath. Yeah. Not good. Okay. But now, um, I do have a historical dimension today, as I always try to. But the idea is, we're going to have a coup d'etat last year, this year, or we may be able to organize a mass upsurge in 2014, 2015. And I'll try to show you some historical uh, precedents for that. I recommend, I commend to your attention, the United Front Against Austerity. This combines two things that we absolutely must have. The notion of a united front, we're dealing with splinter parties, grouplets, groupuscules, organizations, relics of, of older parties that could be revived. And then we have the main overriding question, austerity. Genocidal austerity against the American people. If you propose radical cuts to food stamps, you're talking about killing a number of the 50 million people who rely on food stamps to live. You want the lights on or off? I don't know, try it. See what it's like. See what the people like. Is this better? What do you like? No. Yeah. Lights on. Sure, fine. <laughs> That's fine. Any way you want. You decide. So, against austerity. Now, the United Front Against Austerity, we have some concepts. Nationalize the Federal Reserve. Don't abolish it. Yeah. to my colleague from Brooklyn, we want to deprivatize the Federal Reserve, nationalize it, federalize it, seize it, commandeer it, whatever you want. We've got to get control of the credit creating power because that's how we can solve problems. Yeah. Money is a fiction. Money is a way to move resources, factories and workers. You have money, you put them together, you restart production. That's it in a nutshell. We're in a world economic depression, and we've got to get out of it. Because if we have prolonged unemployment at the current level, and prolonged immiseration, you're going to have dictatorial forms. You're going to have fascism or dictatorship or something. And that is my tale today. Here's another good one. The Wall Street sales tax. 1% comes off the top. I'm sorry, Credico left. This is his principal plank, and therefore he deserves your attention for the coming primaries. A 1% tax on Wall Street turnover would solve every budget problem in the city, state of New York, the United States as a whole. The secret of the fiscal crisis of the federal government is that Wall Street pays nothing. Nothing. They don't pay corporate income tax and they don't pay sales tax. What's the New York City sales tax these days? 9%? 8.25, whatever it is. In Virginia, near where I live, you pay about 8%, and you pay it on your grocery bill. So that is unbelievable. So unlike Occupy, Occupy seemed to think that their goal in life was to go out and, and say bad things about Wall Street and badmouth Wall Street, right? But our goal is something a little bit more ambitious. Make them pay, extract money, and hit them, therefore, in the Labanza where they live. And here's another very important, immediate one. Got student loans? About 40% of people below 30 do. This is outrageous, and this is only the beginning, obviously, of the solution.
But rather than have the current 3.25 or 3.5 or the uh, Obama proposal, which is about 4, or the Republican proposal, which goes up to 8, or the private loan, <laughs> which goes up to 10 or 12, how about three quarters of 1%? This is Senator Elizabeth Warren of uh, Massachusetts with the Bank on Students Act. And the genius of this is the Federal Reserve pays, not the Treasury, not the taxpayer. It's not federal borrowing. It's not taxation. Bernanke is told, cough up the money. Mm. And that's the beginning of the recovery, because that's the principle you need to create 30 million new jobs. Now, we have just come through a phase of danger of coup d'etat. And of course, if you've been listening to Amy Goodman, you don't know that, do you? Mm. You don't know that we came very close to a military coup last November in the election. But we did. And the goal of this, the Romney, we, we actually should, we should felicitate, we should be happy that we don't have Romney. If we had Romney in the White House, the Syrian war would already be going on. And there would be fighting in Syria and Iran, and the United States would be involved. So we've avoided that one. And I think that's, that's obviously better than what we have. The goal of the Romney campaign was to create a permanent dictatorship of austerity and war. All you need to do is pack the Supreme Court with fascist judges, wipe out unions, restrict the franchise so a lot of people can't vote, and you've got the dictatorship under uh, the democratic forms. So that was the choice. It was a Wall Street Democrat or a reactionary Republican embodying what amounts to a fascist regime under current conditions. Now, I tried to protest this, to stop it, to stop it. Just too weird, Bishop Romney and the Mormon takeover of America with polygamy, theocracy, and subversion. Uh, and I think this is, I submit, this is an indispensable source for the presidential campaign of last year. But when you see Mormon takeover, I was on the phone with my publisher in California, and I said, well, what are we going to call it? Coup d'etat. Mormon coup d'etat. He said, no, people don't know what that is. <laughs> How about push? Ah, uh, they still don't know. How about takeover? That they're, they're yeah. that won't they? But this is the idea. And this was an attempted coup d'etat. Amy Goodman forgot to tell you. And here's the centerpiece of it, right? We hear so much about this stuff, I have to just sweep this aside. The Benghazi incident. The Benghazi incident was staged against Obama to drive him out of office. It was an October surprise coming a little bit early in September. Here's what, the New York Post. Uh, it was a, a murderous attack. It's supposed to be the hostage crisis for Carter. This was supposed to do in the uh, Obama candidacy. It's nothing that Obama organized, whatever you think of Obama. Here's another one, the Fox News, right? Help was denied. There was a stand-down order. And there was. There were stand-down orders. But who commanded the people who were told to stand down? It's a seven days in May scenario. Right? Remember the movie? Mm -hmm. A military coup by a clique of generals. Well, who controlled the CIA assets? He did. Petraeus, General Petraeus, and his person is the marriage of the Pentagon and the CIA. That looks rather threatening, doesn't it? So there he is, David Petraeus, the head of the CIA. Any CIA assets in Benghazi that didn't do anything did so putatively on his orders. Why isn't he grilled? Why isn't he dragged in front of that committee? Of course, of course the Republicans won't do it. There are other assets. Carter Ham the head of U.S. AFRICOM. He controls the special forces in Africa. He controls the Sigonella Air Base. You're being told, oh, the only airfield was a you know, 800, 1,000 miles away in uh, Aviano, Italy. Wait a minute, that's at the top of Italy. How about in Sicily? There's the famous Sigonella Air Base, two hours away at most. He could have sent in his assets. He didn't do it. So why, why do we have these, these little people being grilled we want to see grilled ham. <laughs> and then, of course, the Matahari, Cherche la Femme, the Matahari operative, of working for somebody, I don't know, who brought down Petraeus, except 
that Petraeus is now back. As we convene here, in somewhat well, sparse order, the oligarchs convene in Watford, England, at the Bilderberg meeting, right? And he's, Petraeus is there. So if you think, if you think Petraeus is a has-been, guess again. Petraeus is coming after you. We'll talk a little bit about more about him. Now, Obama's problems come from the fact that he has he had a, an inaugural address and he had a State of the Union address. And despite continuing high unemployment, he refuses to propose a job creation program because you couldn't get it through the, the House, I suppose. It doesn't matter. You can get your job creation program through the Federal Reserve with a phone call. Then, tomorrow, we need $4 trillion in a credit stimulus window. You're going to buy the bonds of states. They're going to build infrastructure. Thank you, Ben. Make it happen. And the recovery takes off. In other words, the lawlessness of the Federal Reserve is so overwhelming that it could now be used to create a recovery behind the backs of the Congress. So we would need 30 million new productive jobs paid for by the Federal Reserve. Obama, to survive, in my judgment, would need about a 5 million job creation program, but he has, he has basically nothing. So this defines the vulnerability of the White House. But now, we want to talk about the current situation. Here we are in Syria, okay? And especially the events which have captured the attention of the world in Qusair, in this area here, right? Lebanon. Syria, Jordan, Saudi Arabia, the Mediterranean. We have some other maps. I thought some of them were better. What's going on in Syria? Death squads, terrorists, essentially criminal elements, sociopaths, fanatics, psychotics, unemployed, wretched, drifting people, gathered from half the world, from Chechenia, from Libya, from Somalia, from Tunisia, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, Morocco, and so forth. These are the people who gravitate towards Al-Qaeda. Now, Al-Qaeda is not capable of destroying the Twin Towers of New York City, but they are able to blow up a bus or a supermarket and kill, snipe at women getting their kids out of school, as I, as I was told in, in Syria. These people represent the destruction of civilization as we have known it. And uh, when you look at the dynamic of how this is being done, right, with the US government fomenting these people, you can see how the Roman Empire fell. How could the Roman Empire fall to those barbarians? How could modern civilization be destroyed by these barbarians? It is being destroyed in places like Libya, which I have the honor of visiting, in Syria, I have the honor of visiting, and other other places. Wherever these people come in, chaos and and uh, the collapse of the living standard and so forth will result. But now we have Qusair, a, a turning point, if you will. This is the province of Homs. I've had the honor of meeting the governor of Homs. Mm -hmm. Here's Qusair. And that is the Stalingrad of the death squads. We just lived through a historical turning point this week. The Syrian army and Hezbollah, the most capable fighters, I think we can say in the Middle East right now, have just liberated Qusair. The death squads have been administered a crushing defeat in Qusair. And this is one of the best things that has happened in the world uh, in quite a while. I don't know if you were uh, watching TV on Wednesday morning. This is the clock tower. That it's a building. It looks uh, it's probably on an Italian Renaissance model. Here we have the clock tower in Corsair, and they're raising the Syrian flag. You remember the one with the red army and the Brandenburg Gate in Berlin at the end of World War II? This is it. This is the turning of the time. This is an event of huge importance. We've just gone through a world historical shift. I see people are puzzled. Amy didn't tell you. <laughs> Amy didn't tell you? How about Michael Moore? Did he tell you? How about, how about Gnome? The one that I, I 
affectionately referred to as Ganon. Mm. Did Ganon Chomsky tell you about it? No. But this is what has just happened. The entire world is now realigning around this, and that is opportunities and, and problems for us. This charming lady, as we've just heard in some detail, has effectively supported the destruction of Libya and the destruction of Syria. These are modern states. These are, we can call them, quasi-Nasserist states. And I say this because I'm an old, I'm a follower of um, Nasser, of Egypt. I was in Italy during the Six Day War, 1967, and a bunch of Italians explained to me why you had to support Nasser. And these were uh, convincing uh, arguments, which I've stuck to ever since. The secular, military governments, authoritarian to be sure, but stressing populist economics, subsidies of food, bread, cooking oil, fuel, the other things that we've just heard about. This is, this is what you see in Syria, Libya, and, and even in Egypt, although the current government is trying to destroy it. So she has essentially seconded the State Department line by whitewashing the criminal activities of these death squads, right? And what have they done? Cannibalism, chemical warfare, the assassination of women journalists, kidnapping UN peacekeepers, they, they kill each other, they fight among themselves. This is a plague of locusts, and she wants you to think that these are the heroes of democracy, and so forth. And 100,000 people have been killed in Syria. Yeah, wait a minute. Were they all killed by Assad? Or was, wasn't there this army of, of death squad fighters there whose uh, stock and trade is killing? Now, on Wednesday, we have these two neo-colonialist mummies coming forward. Cameron, the Tory reactionary Colonel Blimp of London, and the Vichy nostalgic Ballon de France. And this is now one tandem. One of the things I found researching Libya is that France and England have merged their defense establishments. They are the same country in that sense. One of them, you can't have one without the other. They, they're so weak and decrepit that they can't act on their own. It's like one of them has the tank and the other one has the aircraft carrier. Or one of them has... You know, one of them is the, the nut and the other one is the room. <laughs> they go together. These are Siamese twins. These are no longer separate countries. This is the Entente Cordiale of 1904 that gave you World War One. This is the Sykes-Picot deal of World War One that gave you decades and decades of strife and misery. And it's the Suez combination of 1956, going after my man, Nasser. Now, they are screaming. What do they want? Guess what they want. The death squads are in danger. There's a, there's a danger, they say, the death squads could be wiped out in the next couple of, of months. What should happen? You know what they want. They want the U.S. to invade. This is the overwhelming fact of world history. These two are screaming. They're both saying, there's chemical weapons being used. Poison gas has been used. Our, our journalists have been kidnapped. The U.S. must invade, yes, as always. Yes. Ready to fight to the last American for Anglo-French imperialism. <laughs> <laughs> this is the reality. Did Amy not tell you? Did, she, did Amy forget to tell you yesterday? All right, so the imperative we have to say is no, no, and no, and no. <laughs> now, enter another left liberal. The London Guardian, anything coming out of Britain, I mean, it's an intelligence work, it's sort of axiomatic. MI5, MI6, run the show. Britain is the most consummate police state of our time, by far. And it's subtle. I mean, it's brutal and it's subtle at the same time. So the Guardian. This character, Greenwald, now gets out on the same day that Cousseur fell on the same day that the screaming of Paris and London for the U.S. to go and fight and die and bleed for these two mummies of imperialism, he comes out with his, his 41 NSA slides, okay? And of course, he's very concerned about civil liberties. Well, these things have been going on, right? One of them, the one with uh, Verizon, that's Bush's warrantless wiretapping, now with a warrant. But more, obviously more. 
And then the other one is the prism, which is snooping your email. I mean, didn't you know that your phones were tapped and your emails were being read? I mean, I sort of knew that, but he seems to think that's new. Now, I submit, whatever he thinks he's doing, this is the most effective tool of the British and the French to get the U.S. into a new war. But our dear friends, the left liberal media, they bow, they genuflect, oh, he's the new Ellsberg, he's the new whistleblower. And then we have these slides, right? You can see there how, how interesting they are with the, all the symbols of the different things, right? This is part of what he has purported to, uh, to reveal, right? And then when they joined in, you know, Microsoft, Yahoo, Google, Facebook, Baltalk, YouTube, Skype, AOL, blah, blah, blah. So fine. So they're reading everything. And Prism, right? That's the name of the program. So you can see these things. Now, where does this stuff really come from? Anybody know what that is? There's one place, there's one place in the world where uh, you can look into the United States automatically, right? Near where I live in Maryland, we have Fort Meade. Fort Meade is the National Security Agency. It's this big black building. Well, going from, north, from Fort Meade across the Atlantic, there's a fiber optic cable, and it goes here. This is called GCHQ. This is the British equivalent of the National Security Agency. It's at a place called Cheltenham, 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 England. Whatever Fort Meade knows, GCHQ knows in real time under the Anglo-American Sharing Agreements. This goes back to World War I, World War II, the Cold War, and everything else. They know everything. So I would submit that the actual origin of these new stories is these people, because they're the ones who know what they do is they spy on their own citizens. If, if I'm in Britain and I'm, I'm working for these people, I want to spy on, you know, Lord X. I don't have to go to a British court and get a warrant to spy on Lord X. I just go through the NSA and I can get whatever the NSA has on Lord X. So I submit that the origin of the stories this week, right, and there's one on, on Wednesday it was, Obama, tax your phones! And on Thursday it was, Obama reads your email. I think they're the source. I think that's where it came from ultimately. Whatever Glenn Greenwald thinks, I think those people are the authors of this whole thing. And the goal of it is, they want the U.S. at war. And I urge you to, to mobilize on this. In other words, to be aware of this and to denounce what is going on. In other words, you, you don't have to support Obama. It's, it's, it's impossible to support Obama, but what you can do is denounce those who are attacking Obama. That you can do, and that you must do. Now, as I said before, today in Britain, the Bilderberg Group is meeting, right? founded by the Nazi Prince Bernard of Holland. Attending, as we've said before, General David Petraeus. You know him, he's the neocon general. For the last couple of years, he has been the focus of Bonapartist dictatorial tendencies. Bonapartism is where the military take over for the dictatorship, okay? His number one backer taking part in Bilderberg is Henry Kravis. This is Colbert Kravis Roberts. He built the biggest corporate empire in the United States history about 1990. His personal fortune is approaching five billion so we can assume that this is a sponsor for Petraeus, as he does what? Go to New Hampshire and start shaking hands for the New Hampshire primary or Iowa? I don't think it's this. I think it's more the man on horseback who is maybe parachuted in from above. The goal, it seems to me, with Obama could easily be Watergate. The Republicans in Washington, I watch them quite closely, they talk of nothing else. They're obsessed with this. They say, the IRS, Benghazi, James Rosen, the AP, and now the NSA and the NSA. Um, is this what you want? You have to make a political decision. It, 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 is it going to help you to get Obama out of this point? The merit Obama has is that when these people come to him and say, we want the war, Obama has said no. 
And somehow in all the swirling rhetoric, the fact that Obama has said no to the war in Syria has gotten lost. I speak as probably the most vehement critic of Obama in the world. <laughs> but I had two books, not one, but two books out in 2008 saying Obama should never be president. One in time for the Pennsylvania primary, one in time for the Democratic convention. Fine. If you wanted to stop Obama, the time to do that was in 2008. Now, though, it's different. Obama is entrenched, and you have to ask yourself, is Obama better or worse than the people who are attacking him? Remember, the war in Iraq has ended, more or less. The war in Afghanistan is ending. Obviously, there was Libya, which I condemn, but that's <coughs> the US role is over. And now we've got Syria. Is it better to get Obama out and have the war in Syria, or is it better to have Obama say no to the war in Syria? I say, that is your vital interest. And you have to be a great realist, right? You can't say, but I'm waiting for the perfect president. I'm waiting for the man of my dreams. <laughs> Forget it. It's not going to happen. You've got to be a great realist and work with what you have. One of my principles in politics is, Find out what the ruling class is doing and oppose them. In 2008, they wanted Obama to save them. Now he has saved them. Now they want him out. And therefore, when they realign, I realign, I urge you to realign. Now, where are we headed? Here's my tale of two depressions. What I'm trying to do with this very simply is this. To show you the parallels between the last depression and the current depression. Okay? You know how it works. It starts, the old one starts with the crash of 1929. The current one starts with the World Derivatives Panic, Lehman Brothers, 2008. Then we go on, 1931, the European banking crisis, Austria, Germany, Britain. The bankruptcy of the British pound. The end of the gold standard in those days. Well, in 2010, it's similar. We have a European crisis the U.S. and the British create a sovereign debt crisis as a means of attacking the euro. Remember, the ruling passion of the U.S. and the British is destroy the euro at all costs. So whenever you see somebody on CNBC saying, oh, oh the euro, we don't like the euro, that's the pound and the dollar talking. Their idea is save the pound and the dollar by wrecking the euro. There was a U.S. banking panic, of course, which shut down every bank in the United States. I would say right now we've got China and India and Brazil slowing down. The bottom in 1933, the interim bottom, the low point of the depression. Now, something different going on now. Right now in Europe, there's some talk of temporarily easing the austerity to prevent a political explosion. But we may have gotten too late. Here's the, here's the big thing. <coughs> we go back to the previous depression. When you get six to seven years into the depression, six to seven years, you get a mass strike upsurge in Spain, in France, and in the United States. We're going to talk, look, look at these in just a minute. Okay? The Popular Fronts in Spain and France, and the Roosevelt Campaign, and the UAW, and the steel workers in the United States. Now here we are, and this is why I want you to think ahead. We are now approaching the six to seven year mark in the current depression. Is it possible that we're looking at a world mass strike upsurge for 2014 and 2015? And if that is possible, are you ready? <laughs> well, the answer is no, we're not ready. Because we have Amy and Ganon. And with Amy and Ganon, we're not ready, are we? Mm. So let's, let's just look at this. Um, Brand X. These are the ones that I, I wanted to uh, remove from consideration. Well, Ganon, right? I'm really, I'm honored. You know, Ganon has ignored me. He, once, he wrote in his books in the, in the middle of the last decade, he said, Anybody who wants to know the truth about 9-11 is probably a government agent. I thought, wow. <laughs> <laughs> I do, but I'm not. I'm not a government agent. So, uh, he 
has just issued a perspective uh, in the beginning, of, well, middle of May, where he talks about Spain in 1936. Spain in 1936. Hey, no, you know, it's right up my alley. But his his uh, his revolutionary vanguard, I'm afraid. He says, are the tribal, indigenous, and aboriginal peoples who are struggling not for economic development, but against any economic <laughs> development, which I find absolutely astounding. Who are we, most people here? The tradition in this country is the Works Progress Administration, the WPA of Harry Hopkins. It's the Public Works Administration of Harold Ickes. It's the Tennessee Valley Authority. It's the Rural Electrification Administration. That is what allowed this country to survive. But here, no, you can't have any of that. And he endorses what he calls ungrowth, degrowth, I call it atrophy. In effect, this is not Marx at all. This is retreating back before Marx to Rousseau. It is the idea of the noble savage. It's the idea that the people who are outside civilization are somehow going to be the key to saving it. And I just don't share this. I think you're going to have to look into the U.S. and into Europe to find uh, the, the, the solutions. And of course, he endorses, since he is an anarchist, he endorses the Spanish anarchists of 1936. And I'm afraid their role was not so good uh, in terms of allowing this. So one of the reasons the Spanish Civil War lost was because of these people. How about Pepe Grillo? You know him? Yeah. He's out now, right? This is the big thing, right? 25, 26% of the votes in February. I've been following this closely. He's a millionaire. This is like um, Bill Maher gets 25% of the votes, right? A foul mouthed, scurrilous, dirty comedian. And his line is no, no infrastructure. No, they say, let's build a bridge from, from Calabria to Sicily. No, let's build a railroad from uh, Turin to Lyon, France. No. And then there are thousands of jobs. So he's anti working class. No great projects, no economic growth, but now this is what they call this is the theory la decroissance. Decrescita. Degrowth. Again, I call it atrophy. They don't like to call it atrophy because most people realize that atrophy is the stage that precedes death. Mm. So they don't want to tell you that. He says no unions. All unions should be broken up. He wants to cut pensions. And then he says, if you're from Africa or someplace like this, if your child is born in Italy, no citizenship. No anchor babies, right? No 14th Amendment. He's a racist. After about 100 days, he's already created this. Just Friday, the day before yesterday, whenever it was, two of his people in, that, in the Chamber of Deputies have quit. They've gone to the uh, independent faction. His endorsements include the US Ambassador, John Kerry's bosom buddy, Goldman Sachs, and they want to use him as a tool against the Euro, OK? So no, no. By the way, this is also, you look at Italy, it's a country where the whole export economy is based on beauty, refinement, elegance, and style. And then you have this guy. His, his slogan is, Baffa. I'm not kidding, I'm sorry. This is it. This is the old, the old fashioned salute, right? This is the old fashioned salute. So he's wrecking the export economy. They look and say, what, that ugly monk? Yeah. What are the French offering these days? <laughs> All right, and then Wolf, as I say, autogestion, local control, worker self-management. These are the failed methods of the Yugoslav model. I wish uh, Credico was still here. That might. Uh, and if you look at Wolf's website, he doesn't seem to tell you that he represents the Yugoslav model. Mm. We want a broad, united, national, and international mobilization, not fragmented according to these different factors. All right, here's another failed model. Obviously, the Paul Tards, the Paul Bearers, Ron Paul, Rand Paul. <laughs> it turns out that after all, you know, they're anti-war. Yeah, they're anti-war, but Ron Paul was the main supporter of Mitt Romney in the primaries, as I, I show in that book in some detail. And now we have little Rand, and they're coming after you. 
No unions, no Social Security, no Medicare, no Medicaid, no unemployment benefits, because that all violates the Austrian school, right? right? And you know, George Washington and Alexander Hamilton were, were from Austria. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so look, here's, here's the hope. That the mass upsurge of 2014-2015 can be parallel to 35-36. We're six to seven years in the Depression. At that point, we got the Spanish Popular Front, the French Popular Front, 36, the, the most radical campaign of FDR, and the unionization, the UAW, the steel workers, and the victory at Remington Rand. In other words, it's the turning point where the U.S. labor movement goes from total defeat to real power. Here's the Spanish one, right? Frente Popular. Largo Caballero is the prime minister. The main problem here is you've got Spanish communists, socialists, anarchists. You've got to get them together into a united front or a popular front. Once you do, even if they have you know, no program or an inadequate program, that's going to be enough to probably take power. Here's the French one, uh, the Popular Front once again. And you can see, against misery, against fascism, against war, and I'm sorry, therefore, bread, uh, liberty, and peace. Peace, peace. Yeah. Okay. And in May 1936, this is the communist newspaper, the victory of the Popular Front, and they get a huge um, electoral victory. And what happens right after that is the French workers say, we don't want to wait for the Parliament, we're occupying our plants. So they got to let you in in the morning to work, and once you're in, you stay. You sit down. So it's the sit down respect. This is one of the first examples of it. And there they are, right? Those are organized French uh, workers. Now, we'd like to see something like that here, wouldn't we? Oh, yeah. Uh, well, what are you doing to make it happen, right? I'm sorry, your macrobiotic food diet is not going to do it. Right? You can keep that up. We want you to be healthy, but yeah, you've got to do something more. Right? And, of course, then, came, then comes Franco. Um, here is Franco with Mussolini, Franco with Hitler. Franco is able to defeat the Spanish popular front with a military coup, with an army. And we have to ask ourselves some of the problems of how that was allowed to go wrong. The other one from 1936 is Roosevelt. 1936 is by far the most radical moment of the New Deal. You know, there's the famous speech, Madison Square Garden at the end of the campaign, and he says, The forces of organized money hate me, and I welcome their hatred. <laughs> Wouldn't we like to hear that from yeah. somebody in the White House? Absolutely. Um, well, why not? Yeah. Why not? Right? It, it's been done before. It can be done again. And here's the 1936 election. This is in the early evening. Roosevelt is leading in 46 states. Ultimately, it's 48 states, except for Maine and Vermont. It's all New Deal. New Deal Roosevelt. Look, even Utah. I mean, unbelievable success. Right? This is the greatest landslide in recent U.S. history. And of course, the, uh, the old saying is, as Maine goes, so goes Vermont. <laughs> <laughs> and then, the UAW, a couple of months later, right, similar to those French guys we saw, what do they do? Here's an assembly line, right? Got some cars. Sit down. Right? Get your demand. Stop production. What are they going to do? Bring the artillery and bombard the plant? <laughs> That'll be an expensive proposition. They might kill you, but they'll destroy their, their machine tool investment. Right? So the idea is that this starts in December of 36, and by the beginning of 1937, General Motors caves, the UAW is recognized, the steel, U.S. steel is so scared that they're going to have sit-downs that they say, okay, okay, we give up. We, you can have a union. And then the other big one is Remington Rand, which was um, typewriters, right? Massachusetts, upstate New York, and so forth. And that, that's uh, Walter Ruther, right? Yeah. So some labor history. This is now Ford. This is a little bit later. 
And those are goons. Those are fascist goons, right? That might be Hermann Göring and Goebbels and so forth, right? Whenever I think of Hermann Göring, I think of Governor Christie. <laughs> but here they come. They want to beat these guys up, and they, they do beat them up. And right a couple of seconds after this is taken. Is it not possible to imagine some return to uh, popular struggles on these models? So look, what are, the, what are the lessons valid today? First of all, stop protesting. I mean, we need more than protest. We want to take some power. We want to slice off a piece of power, some, some form, right? You look at the Tea Party, 75 to 80 congressmen, six senators, various governors. Occupy. Zero. Nothing. That looks to me like failure. And nothing fails like failure. Americans love a winner. They're not going to love that. Look, the other one is realism and survival, not utopia. Representative of Syriza, when we had our United Front Against Austerity founding conference in uh, Walker Street last October, right? Two days before the storm, one day before the storm. We had a representative of Syriza on a film, and he said, look, Forget about your dreams of utopia. Forget about your ideal society. It's not going to be the imagination taking power. For most people, it is survival that's at stake. The families, right? Joe Sixpack, the average person, the working stiff, right? The man in the street, Jan, John Doe, Jane Doe, they want to survive economically. They don't care about your, your anarchist fantasy of world renovation. So forget utopia. Think about this. Now, what are your demands? Well, first of all, you better have some demands. Occupy said, oh, we can't have any demands. We might win our demands, and then we'd, we'd be co-opted. <laughs> well, this is your goal. Make sure that your demands are powerful enough so that you have a new society when the demands are fulfilled. And I would go with the golden wisdom of Frederick Douglass, who said, power concedes nothing without demand. Because if you want something, you damn well better ask for it, or you can forget it. We need anti-austerity demands. Mass traction anti-austerity demands. Simple things. Medicare for all. Stop foreclosures. Cut student loan debt. And so forth, right? 30 million jobs paid for by the Fed. You can sloganize this stuff down to the level where the most humble person and most uneducated person can perfectly well grasp it, right? You look at all the hot air coming out of Wall Street, and you look at somebody like Lenin, right? All power to the Soviets, peace, bread, land. Something along those lines, that kind of concision, right? So mass traction, anti-austerity demands. What you do not need is the petty bourgeois stuff, the process reforms. The process reforms are term limits or increase the budget of the Securities and Exchange Commission, or corporate personhood, it's fine, or Glass-Steagall. Glass-Steagall has merit as a demand, but this has no impact on the lives of these people who are struggling for survival. It's got to go direct. It's not, let's reorder the system so we can then fight for the things we really need. No, direct. We fight for the things we really need right now, today, and in the process, you can reform the system. Because the other way never works. You never get to phase two. So forget petty bourgeois process reforms. Forget anarchist stunts. The poor occupied. They had no demands. They said, well, eventually, we're in the park. The entire society will join us in the park. And at that time, the whole thing will become a park. No. It never worked. It couldn't work. Here's another one. Election campaigns and labor struggles go together. Do both. Anarchists don't like election campaigns. You better have them, and you better have labor struggles and other mass, mass uh, struggles. Now here's the other one. In the French Popular Front, and this was the decisive one, there was a proposal to nationalize the Bank of France, to seize control of the Bank of France, which was owned by 200 families. Similar to what we have today behind the scene. Right. Dell that looks sort of like that. The communists, unfortunately, said, no, Stalin is afraid that if we nationalize the Bank of France, the bourgeoisie will be so scared that they won't help Stalin. Mm. Instead, our approach is the main thing 
is get control of the central bank. And at this point, any Keynesian, Krugman, Stiglitz, they're hopeless. These leftists and Keynesians have basically nothing to say about the Federal Reserve. Naturally, the libertarian lunatics say, destroy it, get rid of it. No, seize it, deprivatize it, and then we can use it. Because you can use that to create unlimited amounts of credit. So use the central bank to finance job creation recovery, 30 million new jobs. Now, I think those are lessons of 35, 36, and we've had to relearn those lessons through these terrible defeats of the last uh, couple of uh, couple of years. <coughs> now, a couple of things, just uh, time is short. One of the factors in the mass strike process, and hint, hint, Amy forgot to tell you. Who's helping? Assad. You know the way you can get a rebellion against the government is by having that government defeated in foreign affairs? It's like the, the um, Russian Revolution of 1905. Right? They lose the war against Japan, and the internal situation blows up. Well, he is helping. The valiant resistance by Assad against these dead squads has set up a situation where, especially in Europe, the thing is low sky high, because those guys, Cameron and Hollande, are so far on the limb for the terrorists that, that the more Assad does, the worse off they are. And these are both people that, that Amy Goodman wants you to hate. Right? Assad is your objective ally, and so is Putin. Right? If it hadn't been for Putin, the U.S. would already be at war in Syria and probably Iran as well. But here's the net that counts, right? <laughs> Sending S-300 anti-aircraft missiles, Yakonsk uh, anti-ship missiles, the, so the Russian fleets have been concentrated in the eastern Mediterranean, uh, and other forms of diplomatic and, 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 and other... Why, can you just say why Amy Goodman wants us to hate these people? Well, you have to ask Amy Goodman about that. But you so said... If you, said. you listen, you know, why is another story. But that if you listen to her, you know she does. These are people, he's a tyrant, of course. He's a tyrant, right? He, he's mean to Pussy Riot. There we go. He, he's not nice to Pussy Riot. Pussy Riot. Pussy Riot, by the way, are racists. They are national Bolsheviks. They hate Chechens and, and uh, these other people from the Caucasus. Now, here's another one. Amy wants you to hate the new pope. The new pope is one of the best things that has happened lately. This is a gritty guy from the slums. Las favelas, barrios, bidonville of Buenos Aires, right? This is the wretched of the earth are his parishioners, right? So if, you, if you've read any of his statements, he says, money has to serve. Money will not be allowed to rule. There's an invisible power of money that has to be broken. Yeah, but he ratted out the priests, right? Lies! No, no, no. no lies! <laughs> lies! <laughs> okay. That's the, the slander machine, right? Yeah. Okay. The slander, we're hearing all about the slander machine. That's Amy Goodman and the slander no, machine. You're going to blame the Argentine junta on him? Why don't you blame Kissinger? And Kissinger, not this guy. What is, what is his magical powers? He's supposed to tell Emilio what to do? Look, what's coming here is a guy, this is an enemy of the International Monetary Fund. This says everything. He's an enemy of austerity. He's in favor of social and economic justice. You tell that to Limbaugh, Limbaugh says, communism! He's against neoliberal, monetarist, and Austrian economics. Now, there's going to be a, an encyclical soon where he attacks these things. And at that point, the ruling class will go bonkers in the United States and in Europe. I believe this guy is the key to reviving Europe after decades of demoralization. Here, here's another good one, right? The Muslim woman prisoner, and he washes her feet for, uh, for Monday Thursday. Here's another one. 1.1 million, 1.1 trillion student loan debt. Here's a kid, right, 25,000 plus, it's usually 30, 35,000 these days. An entire generation is being crushed. They're waiting to be radicalized, okay? Let's help them to become radicalized with a program. And here's the answer, Elizabeth Warren actually delivering on the promises of attacking Wall Street. 0.75% interest rates paid for by the Federal Reserve. If you're not mobilizing on this, you are spinning your wheels. Mm. And here's another one, Alexis Tsipras. 
This is a good, this is a serious organization, Syriza. They have program, organization, strategy, and leadership. All the things that Occupy told you, you shouldn't have. You shouldn't even want to have. And with this, I believe they might take power this year. In other words, the right-wing austerity government is always rickety. He could take power this year. That would also uh, excite the attention of the world. Right? You, you look at the way he's treated compared to the way Occupy is treated. You'll see how the ruling class treats somebody that they really, they really fear. So this is another big positive thing. The two enemies that you must be fighting, and they're really all there are, this, Wall Street. What can you do with them? Tax them. Certain derivatives can be banned, right? Credit default swaps, collateralized debt obligations, banned. Energy derivatives, banned. But 1% on the transactions. And the Federal Reserve. And again, take your pick. You privatize, federalize, nationalize, come here, seize the Federal Reserve, issue cheap long-term federal credit for economic recovery, 30 million new jobs, high capital investment per job. Support the UFAA. What's the UFAA? The United Front Against Austerity. You came late. I did. That's right. <laughs> and I wanted to offer a critique. Some of us were lined up last night to ask a few questions. And it turned out it wasn't the left forum, it was the far right forum. No questions, worse than the National Press Club. Hey kid, write your, write your question on the card and maybe we'll take you. Can we just get Reverend Pinkney to come up and say hello? Thank you. I'm really, really happy to be here. But the only thing I, I just want to let everybody know, I live in Benton Harbor, Michigan. Um, we are the very first city that actually had a dictator. Uh, they call him an emergency manager. He came in with absolute power. Uh, the first thing he did, he destroyed, he fired the mayor. Took his desk and put it in the basement. Then he locked the commissioners out, all the elected officials. Then he started, they started getting rid of all the land. Distributed land. But actually, they worked, this guy worked for Whirlpool Corporation and the governor. The governor sent them in, and Whirlpool was back at that. But we stood up and fought. How much time we have? I think it's about 10 minutes. Well, uh, we have plenty of time. Yeah. Okay. Have, uh, I think that uh, there's going to be a break in the proceedings. So, if anyone wants to stay, you're welcome. Go ahead, Reverend. Yeah, okay. So, here, here, here's what's happening here. They brought in. Uh, the governor brought in this, this uh, they call him the emergency man, but he's a dictator, he had absolute power. When he elected, he was placed there. And he placed there to destroy the city and to turn it over to Whirlpool Corporation. And what Whirlpool Corporation is doing, they are identifying the whole city. They just built a Jack Nicholas signature golf course. And it costs $10,000 per year just to uh, become a member. The average salary in the city of Benton Harbor is less than $10,000. You got 70% of the people that live inside Benton Harbor are unemployed. You got 90% living below the poverty level. And then they want to come in and take over the whole city, drive the people completely out of the city. At one time, we had about 30,000 people living in the city. Now we got less than 10,000. So 20,000 people are missing. And uh, that's in Benton Harbor, Michigan. And what they have done is so, uh, uh, you have the news media saying how wonderful this is. You see, how the, the streets inside Benton Harbor are all raggedy, and then you got Whirlpool Corporation over there by the golf course, all nice and neat. So what we have here, Whirlpool, did, not only did they take over our city governor, now, we got nine elected officials. They're all black. When we put them in office, we were seven to two. We had seven for the people, two for Whirlpool. Now they got eight and a half, and we got a half. <laughs> so that's how it's working now. When you talk about taking over stuff, this is what's happening. This is what we call gentrification, and this is what's going on today. Not only that, in the city of Detroit, the uh, biggest city, they, what they did, they used Benton Harbor as a testing ground to see how far they can go. And believe me, it's coming to your city next. 
But we fought. We fought it so hard. When we put out there, we stood up. You know, we protest. We did things that nobody ever done. And we, we led it in a way that people across the country heard about it, but they couldn't believe it. Most of the time, you hear about when you say, that we're, we're, we're a, 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 a democracy where your votes don't mean nothing. You can elect somebody and put them in office, and they can say, well, he's just there. They're, he's just there. They do whatever they want to do. Yes. Yeah, and then yeah. we sit back and allow it to happen. You know, a lot of times you can imagine, like I said, every year, every four years, we win the election. We put five, six people in office. And before the year's out, they become their people. <laughs> and it's just that simple. But we have to learn how to take this thing to a whole different level. We have to learn to fight together. We have to learn to read this stuff uh, and, and understand how serious this is. This is a, some serious stuff. Nobody will believe that, that, you know, that there's someone there who was, even, was not even elected by the people is making decisions for you. Just recently, they decided they want all the parks in the city of Benton Harbor. Benton Harbor is surrounded by water. We got four parks that's right off Lake Michigan. These other parks, they're just using them as a camouflage. But they're talking about but they're talking about, they're talking about these parks that, 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 so that they can use their boats and yachts to come in. They're building half a million dollar condominium to go around the golf course. Million dollar homes on our beach. This is what they're doing. Showing you and I, we can do whatever we want. You can say whatever you want. You can get mad if you want to, but it means nothing. And that's the way it's set up now. And people are really concerned. And that's one of the reasons why I, I come to form just to educate the people about drugs. If you don't believe what I'm saying, look it up on the internet. Reverend, you're preaching to the choir. That's a great speech. But most of us are activists. Yes. Most of us will be with you if we go to fight. Yes. I, I wanted to comment on something. Let's just say. Amy forgot to okay. huh? Okay, well, let, let me finish. Yeah. yeah, let me finish saying this. Why don't you just tell the quick story about the vote and how Snyder comes back and, oh. and then reimposes it? Oh, absolutely. See, what we did, we went out and got 167,000 signatures to repeal uh, Public Act 4, which was put on the ballot. It was, it was a challenge to get a hunger. We got 226,000, but it took 167,000 to have it repealed and put on the ballot. So we, we won the election, we won, we put it on the ballot. Two weeks later, the Governor Snyder went out and they wrote another bill, Al Pachoka, the House representative, wrote another bill, and they signed it into law. It had a new public act, it has Public Act 436 instead of Public Act 4. And that's what they're doing now. They're, what they're doing if you, let's say, if you go, you put it on the ballot, you win, then they'll write another bill. It's just to show you what they can do. Just show you power. Because the people are silent. You know, we understand, you know, and just like he said, we're, you're, you're preaching to the choir, but what is the choir going to do? That's the question. Yeah, what's the choir going to do? You know? And, you know, I can sit up here and talk about it all day, but I don't have that much time to sit here and tell you all about it. But, but we have to get out here and stand up and fight this situation. Because it is coming to your city next. I don't care how. It's, it's already in Pennsylvania. It's already there. California. You know, they just not talking about it. Detroit, the biggest city, uh, 800,000 people. They got an emergency manager now. But it's coming. But listen, let's stand up and fight. Let's let them know we can't, we're not taking this mess no more. Let's do what we did. I do have a newspaper that I, I can pass out to you that you can read some of the things I wrote, but I don't want to take up too much more of your time. I'm just happy to be here, and I'm here to fight. Thank you. Yeah. One of the cities, one of the cities under dictatorship is Flint, Michigan. Right. Flint, Pontiac, right. Ecorse, Detroit, Benton Harbor, Maybe Michael Moore forgot to tell us about 
about uh, Flint. He's supposed to be so devoted to Flint. Somehow he forgot. Yes, what were you going to say? Hold on for one more minute. One moment. I just want to make this announcement. These are up here for anyone who wants them. I put this together very quickly, but it's two pro uh, speeches and rallies of the anti-war movement before Occupy. And uh, the last one is in Harlem, where 5,000 people took to the streets and protested the NATO bombing of Libya. You have a speech by Charles Barron in New York, uh, city councilman, very rising speech. And you also have the poem by uh, Amiri Baraka, uh, someone blew up America, he was jazz accompaniment. So that was on Thank you. It's, uh, don't, I'll take any donation you want to give. Or if you don't have any money and you want to give one, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Let's take a question. It's a political program and as a perspective. As a political program and as a perspective, if I everything what Webster was saying, I think your painting was way too broad a brush. I was involved in the Occupy, but I didn't stand around and commune with fellow spirits. We were able to use Occupy to take people out of the occupation and get them to do things, including strike support. There was a strike uh, going on, a lockout going on against one of the main corporations. We put corporate campaign pressure on the owners. We said we were occupied. I had said I was from the committee with the 6.2 International. It wouldn't have worked. We said we were occupied. People knew what that meant. How did they know? Because the news covered it. Because the, because the main news covered it. You're absolutely right that, uh, that there's no reason to skip on the, the movements that are helping us. No, 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 make this point. I'm done. Yeah. It's absolutely clear that, that, that Putin's uh, perspective, it's absolutely clear that, that the, um, uh, the Pope's perspective are helpful. That doesn't mean we're in a popular front with this people. It just means the knowledge that doing good things. The Soviet Union was the main ball of the fighting fascism in World War II. That doesn't give any validity to the Soviet Union as a social system. Um, okay, and see, you, but you, you mistake me. I, I don't have any animus against these guys. I want more for them. I want to see 75 to 100 of them in Congress, in the House of Representatives. I just have to say, get out of this damn anarchist mindset. Just forget about air busters. The situation is international. There's a counterinsurgency created by NATO against the Absolute point, and then I'm, I'm done. The Popular Front in France in 37, 36, 37, 38, was absolutely controlled by the communists and ruined by the communists, no question. But the issue of steel, of taking over the banks, would have been a, a deep dividing problem had there been no CP that was tied to the Russians. The ruling class would not have gone along with it. You could have had civil war. By the same token, Syriza, I hope they win. I love Syriza. I also fear for Syriza. I think should they take power, there's going to be a coup and they will be murdered. And, the reason, and what will happen is there's no forces on the bottom to protect them. Taking government doesn't mean taking power. It also means operating on 99% of the things you said. That we don't uh, disagree about. Elections are necessary, but so is organizing at, at the base. And that's what's kind of missing for you. Yeah. Well, at least I can be what do you think I'm trying to do here? That's what he was saying. <laughs> We're, look, we, we want to intervene in the fast food strikes now in about five different places. We just heard from, from Reverend Mickey. That's the kind of grassroots organizing we okay, certainly support. Uh, but okay, back to Obama. Obama is a tool of the criminal elite, right? But up to a point, huh? okay, not completely. Wait. But the Republicans aren't happy because he's not their tool. So they're going after him for impeachment, right? Now, Obama, I don't think, can be moved to populist because he's playing now for his post presidency fortune. All right? He ain't giving that up. So. Could I just, I, I would say Obama is trying to survive now from week to week. <laughs> I want to focus you on the main okay, issue. Okay. War with Syria, yes or no? Can I just so far from Obama, it's no. Okay. And you've got to register that, and I don't think you have. Why is it no? no wait, Why one more no? thing. The impeachment could derail his massacre of Social Security and Medicare. Shouldn't be be before the impeachment. No, because if, 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 if he's out, then it's going to get worse. Well, it's only impeachment and, and creates a mess. He won't really be actually taken out of office. Sure he will. I mean, I well, you know, the, the Senate just clicked 
we now have the, the New Jersey went from Lautenberg to this other guy. Look, I'm just trying to say you've got to have your your approach has got to be based on real intelligence. And the premise of our little gathering here is that Amy Goodman and Michael Moore and Guillaume are not giving you the intelligence because they're they're putting you in this fantasy world morality play where Glenn Greenwald is a great guy and Obama's listening to your phones, but you gotta ask yourself, in this terrible situation, who's benefiting from Glenn Greenwald's articles this week, right now? Isn't it the British and the French who sponsor their publication, who want to soften up Obama so they can go to him and say, look, you're collapsing, you better come with us and we'll call off our, our slander attacks. I'm also, I welcome the partisanship between Obama and the Republicans is what I ardently desire. And I've tried to get in the middle between them. That stuff about Petraeus and Carter Ham, I'm trying to get in between Obama and the Republicans on Benghazi and make them fight more, not less, to save precisely the entitlements that you point to. But you've got to, in other words, you've got to be a little bit more sophisticated, more of a pro, to say, look, I'm supporting Obama on Syria, but I'm attacking him. On, on genocidal austerity. Well, Why is he not going into Syria? I mean, is, is this all, all of a sudden some kind of moral imperative? No, I, I mean, I would just say Obama is uh, just read. Brzezinski will explain it to you. Well, Brzezinski has part of it, right? Brzezinski on this issue is useful. Right, Brzezinski says, don't get dragged into a war for the sake of the British and the French because they want to restore French colonialism in, in, in Syria. I would say Obama is a narcissist who says, if I attack Syria that's bad for Obama, I won't do it. But in, in today's politics, this is already a lot. This is something to work with, right? And, if, and look, if you wait in this world to find somebody doing the right thing for the right reason, you will wait a long time. I'm trying to get people to do the right thing for the wrong reasons, or for any goddamn reason, if I can. Right? But the important thing is that they do the right thing. So I, I'm not going to catechize, I'm not going to force Obama to come to confession before I accept that he's against the war in Syria, right? Because he wants to survive. Right, you can't be that much of a danger. And it's also what you said for the clock. You know, a broken clock is right two times a day. Well, well so somebody else. Yeah. <laughs> so look, we urge you to act. The point of this is not information, but action. Action. <laughs> What's the, and do you think that uh, this is an opportunity for Obama to reverse himself on, on uh, Social Security uh, only because his only power now may be in the people, not in these, uh, in these elites who are going to throw him under the bus because he won't uh, uh, invade uh, Syria and create World War III. Is, is that possible that he will find his power in the people once again? Well, that's what's happening right now. In other words, when Obama says no war with Syria, he has overwhelming support. Yeah, but and, and to firm it up with... Uh, but that's uh, why, you see, the reason that Glenn Greenwald is so sinister in all this, in the yeah. Guardian, is that they're attacking Obama where it really hurts him. In other words, Obama's base actually does care about civil liberties. With Bush, no. it didn't matter. No. But with Obama, it does matter. So you're really hurting Obama. Yeah. And I saw the mood, the mood here about Obama is obviously... There's a seething resentment, yes, which sure. I understand, which I share, which I help to create. Sure. But the the moment, the first moment of sympathy I had for Obama was uh, Mutala, December 25th, 2009, the Detroit underwear bomber. And in the days after that, please go to Tarkley.net and look at it. In the days after the underwear bomber, yeah, he was set up. The Obama White House told MSNBC Richard Wolf. This was deliberate. Yes. Somebody wants to embarrass us. And yes. later it turned out there was an interagency meeting right. where the State Department says, that guy's a terrorist, we're pulling his visa. And an unnamed agency, was it the FBI or the CIA or the NSA, who was it? They said, no, 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 he keeps his visa, we're following him, we have eyes on him, he'll, he's a little fish, he'll lead us to the... Okay, what about the Boston, to, to the, the Boston brothers? Hang on, hang on. Now you it's more, those are, that, that's the same tradition. All the attacks on Obama come out of the same bag. 
It was their all October surprise attacks on. You think they let that happen in Boston? Of course they did. But it's so clear. But the, the Ritala, I'm trying to say, the turning point with Obama, where Obama seems to have understood that he was under attack by the rogue network, right? by them, the forces above and behind the Oval Office. That's December 2009. Right. Okay? Right. And that, I, for me, that was the, the first moment that I said, well, I, I, I see him now under attack in the way that I didn't see. He had just given the West Point speech on Afghanistan, Pakistan, where he announced the surge. And you had to conclude, the rogue network thought that the surge was not enough. And they were not happy with Obama. They wanted something bigger compared to, to what he was was offered. Right? So you, you could see, a, a, you, the more you look at it, the more you see that a lot of what he does is already a response. Plus, we have Ray McGovern of the CIA, recently now on record, saying there's a meeting with Obama and his supporters. And the supporters say, hey Obama, you're no good, you don't do anything, you break your promises. And Obama says, don't you remember Martin Luther King, don't you remember the assassinations. And the conclusion of this guy, uh, Ray McGovern, is Obama fears assassination by the CIA, and he is using John Brennan, he thinks, to suppress this danger. Please look at the most recent article on Coffee.net. Do you agree with that? My article? I think it's very plausible. I would take that seriously. There's a long tradition of people saying Obama's life is in danger to try to whip up sympathy for Obama. But now I think it's changed. And the reason is, it's because of the Syria issue. Syria, Syria, Syria. And that, of course, means Iran and Hezbollah. In other words, it's the big Middle East war. And the British and the French seem to want it. And Obama seems to be saying no. I would take a hold of that with both hands and my teeth. You see what I mean? Anybody attacking Obama now, I'm, I'm very critical of them. I want a counterattack, right? Somebody, the Guardian attacks Obama, I want to show you that's British intelligence attacking Obama. Why are they doing it? You see what I mean? It's, I can't, I'm not even here to endorse Obama. I'm just saying, the people who are attacking Obama, demanding impeachment, yes. and all the rest of this stuff, they are acting for war, whether they know it or not. Yeah. And they should goddamn stop it. However, his attack on, on uh, uh, Social Security and uh, Medicare, Medicaid, you know, the uh, sequester and the, uh, sure. you know, the 1.3 trillion is going to take out of, uh, you know, the uh, medical access and all that, uh, also shows a side of him where he is uh, uh, not sympathetic to the, uh, the struggle to survive uh, at of all. Of course. But that was, all of that was discussed in his private interview with the Washington Post editorial board a week before his first inauguration. He said, my real job is Social Security and Medicare. Social Security is easier, Medicare is harder, but we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna cut them. Fine. The, I guess the, the, the idea is, at what point does Obama become a drifting enemy, a drifting free agent up for grabs? This may be closer than we think. You see what I mean? And obviously, we, it, the, the, all of that stuff. I, I write things telling you, know, Obama, if you don't have a jobs program, you are yes, a job program. Yes. If you keep attacking, yes. if you attack Syria, Medicare, and Social Security, you are gone. Yes. Goodbye, finish. Yes. Yes. But then you want to say, Obama, save yourself. Yes. Right? It's for your benefit. Don't, don't argue national yeah, interest. Yeah, yeah, don't yeah. argue. You say, it's bad for you, Obama. And then when he goes out, we, we, we just uh, we've discussed some of these issues. Obama goes, Obama lives for adulation. He, he's a narcissist. He wants to go out there and take the, the bath in the crowd. And he goes to the National Defense University and he says, actually a very useful thing. He says, I want to roll back the authorization to use military force. So he's okay. He's done something good on Iraq, Afghanistan, and the authorization to use military force. And Syria, this is, this is something. But he goes to this thing, and who do we get? Medea Benjamin screaming about drones and Guantanamo, but not a word about Syria. Nothing about Syria. Right. So this really hurts him. He says, what? I can't even get adulation anymore? I have to listen to this Medea Benjamin? The heckling of Obama there, the heckling of Michelle, that's, those are threats. That says, we can get you any time. The, um, we also have two movies. I should have included these. The two movies. White House Down, Olympus Has Fallen. There are now two big feature films with famous stars, which are what? 
commando attacks on the White House and the President is taken prisoner. Yeah, they're, they're prepping the Those are warnings. Those of us who have studied 9-11 truth um, with some depth, Hollywood accredits the means, the components of the mythological event have to be established in the psyche of the masses beforehand. And that is what was done. For example, the, the crashing down of buildings comes from the Fight Club. Okay? Just one example. There are lots of examples. Right? Zombie apocalypse. Zombie apocalypse, too. Right? I mean, that's, that, that's mainly an attack on New York. Right? That, that Obama might take that seriously, as far as I can see. But these two movies, not one, but two, with the same idea right, that the White House is going to be attacked, this, I think, this, uh, this must uh, impress me. So we've got this entire psychological warfare pattern. Uh, I think he, he fears assassination and a coup. And I think the way, the way you do something about that is to loudly denounce what is happening. Certainly, don't applaud Gren Greenwald like the, the auditorium full of dupes we had last night. <laughs> right, they show you Gren Greenwald, oh, he's a hero! Yeah, he's going to send you to war in Syria if he gets it. Not that he knows it. He doesn't know it, but that's the effect. Yes. In other words, he's just somebody. There are some people, you put them into action. He's like a little robo man. Right? What is he going to do? He's going to attack Obama on, on human rights. Fine. And normally that's fine. Normally that's good. But you have to ask, why now? And cui bono, cui protest right now. So focus more on Syria. Realize that there has been this absolute watershed in Syria on Wednesday of this week. The rebellion in Syria should now collapse within two to three months. And there'll be, the British and the French are screaming, the CIA is screaming, the neocons are screaming, wait a minute, that's our secret army. Those are the people who fought for us in Libya, and now we brought them to Syria. That's what Ambassador Stevens and Ambassador Ford built up. And now it's going to be destroyed. So uh, the pressure to attack and of course, even you know, Netanyahu, the Israelis, Iran, Hezbollah, all of this, right? So the, the, the idea is a propaganda mobilization, which everybody can take part in, right? Anybody can be on Twitter. Say, this is punk, no war with Syria, stay out of Syria. I, I applaud the New York Review of Books, they have a big article, stay out of Syria, that's good. Uh, Webster, one of the things that I find that the, the left is seems to be almost unaware of, and it's a historical uh, trend, but I know you know about it. Can you say anything briefly about the eugenics aspect of what's going on, the eugenics agenda that seems to be so out of the consciousness of uh, the left? I don't know. I don't, I, I don't think this is really a salient aspect of the stuff that we're doing right now. But I'm, what I'm trying to point to right now is this is a very, very short-term extreme emergency. You see what I mean? And uh, I'm afraid a lot of the people who are pushing the, the eugenic stuff are a lot, it, it just it leads us into a can of worms, which I think we certainly don't have time for. Can, 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 you, can you say a little more about your understanding of what happened in Boston? I live there. In? In, in Boston. Boston. Yeah. It's so simple. The, the Chechens in the United States are an elite. There are a few thousand. Right? There are lots and lots of Chechens in Europe. And then there are lots and lots of Chechens in other countries in the Caucasus, trans Caucasus, like Pakistan, different places. So you look at this at this family, right? Near, near, near me in Maryland, there's Uncle Ruslan. And Uncle Ruslan was married to um, a top CIA official's daughter. What's his name? Graham? I've heard that. Graham? Yes, it is. So Uncle Ruslan is obviously a rather important operator. I know the, I know their land, I know the landlady where they lived in Cambridge. Okay. So Uncle Ruslan is some kind of an operator. Now we have the two boys. And the testimony of the mother is the FBI was all over them, the FBI was in touch with them, the FBI monitored them, and so forth. So let's compare that to uh, maybe one that you don't know so well. The Toulouse shooter of about 14 months ago, Mohamed Mera, attacked the Jewish school and other targets in Toulouse, France, just at the moment when Sarkozy needed that to get his campaign going for president of France. It didn't work, but they tried. It turned out that Mera was very well known to the French authorities, that he had been sent on a tour of the Middle East, basically all the countries, by French DGSE, Direction Générale des Services Extérieurs. And he was apparently in contact sometimes with the head of that, Dominique 
Squacini, I think his name was, Squacini. So he was an asset. This Mohammed Mera was well known to the French services. And what you're left with is, did he ever shoot anybody? Sure, they came after him and they wanted him dead. So they wiped out Mohammed Mera. But you're left with, there's no proof. And now we look at the two, at the two boys. Um, the elder one had gone over to the Caucasus and had taken part in this conference of the, um, it's a foundation, the Jamestown Foundation, which is a creation of William Casey of the CIA. So he had frequented that. And that was a confab of anti-Russian terror operatives uh, under the auspices of this branch of the Jamestown Foundation. So we're talking to people who are you know, fairly well in, in, you know, into the Patsy. These are Patsies because they're, they're double agents, but they're expendable double agents. And there's also element of psychotic. What was, what was, what was, the, what was to be gained? Who was going to benefit? from this taking, of being allowed to take place in Boston? There are a couple of things, but let me just, I, I have one or two oh, other sorry. things about this. The, the idea is um, the Russians. This is important too. The Russians said, not once, but twice. Watch out for these people. These are dangerous. Pay attention to them. Da, 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 da. And then we have this unbelievable Robert Mueller comes up and says, oh, we did everything we had to do. It's absolutely ridiculous, right? Once a leading foreign power right. with valuable intelligence puts a finger on somebody, that should follow you pretty much for the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. And they, nevertheless, they simply ignore it, right? So yeah, the question now, here's market, the question. Yeah. And this, this is what I treat in my book, 9-11 Synthetic Terror Made in USA. Is the issue connecting the dots and why don't they talk to each other? No. It's that there are moles. Moles are in there. And the, jo the job of the mole is to make sure that the patsy is not rounded up. As far as the actual blowing up and killing, we have to f suspect the existence of technicians, trained killers, pros in the background. Similarly with Mutala, here he is, he's a patsy, he's a psycho. His father tells the State Department, my son is a terrorist, do something. What do they do? They have the interagency meeting. The State Department guy says, take his visa away. That would have kept him far away. An unnamed agency says, no, he keeps it. Is that a mole? We want to know what that agency is. We still don't know. Obama should be interested in these things. So if you look at the progression, Mutalab, Benghazi, Boston, these are all now events which are somehow anti-Obama. Under Bush, terrorism was somehow pro-Bush. It helped Bush, right? Bush became, the more terrorism there was, the stronger Bush got, right? Ashcroft, whenever there was a bombing, Ashcroft said, that means I need more power, right? Under, under ministerial responsibility, if something like that happens on your watch, you're fired. That would have been the idea. So there are moles. There's a network of moles in these federal institutions, and their job is to make sure that the patsies are not interfered with, until the event has occurred. And then, of course, they have to be immediately rounded up. And their job is to make sure that, uh, that uh, the technicians are not interfered with, because, you gotta make, because they're the ones who really make these things, make these things happen. So that, that progression, I would urge Obama to look back. Look at Mutala. Your instincts were right, Obama. Look, look at it, Benghazi. The chain of command is what counts. Not, the, not who's president, not even who's secretary of state, not even the Joint Chiefs of Staff, but the chain of command. That goes for 9-11 too. The chain of command is Petraeus and Ham, and maybe Stavridis. Those three. That's it. All the rest of it is fluff. So there's a, there's a network. And, I, and now we're going to have um, a new head of the FBI. I, as, as Robert Mueller leaves, I would say, Mueller, how many moles did you catch? Yeah. As far as I know, none. The previous one, we had Aldrich Ames and we had Hanson. Those were your two moles of the previous decade. And they were supposedly Soviet moles. But now we want to know, in the age of terrorism, how many moles, how many terror moles have you ousted? So Robert Mueller leaves office zero. Moles for who? The, the, for Wall Street, for the road network. In other words, the force, which is, this gets me into my critique of this thing last night, 
with Franklin D. Roosevelt. We have an assassination attempt in 1933, a coup attempt in 1934, another coup attempt in 1937, another coup attempt in 1942, and then a successful poisoning. And unfortunately, our two heroes last night found a way to leave all of that out. In other words, the assassination of Franklin D. Roosevelt, the poisoning of Franklin D. Roosevelt. One of the merits of their film is that they cite Elliot Roosevelt in the book called As He Saw It, which is Elliot Roosevelt recounting the bitter struggles between Roosevelt and Churchill. Churchill attempting to save the British Empire, Roosevelt determined to break it up. When Roosevelt's son, Elliot, went to visit Stalin in 1946, Stalin said to him, the Churchill gang killed your father. The Churchill gang poisoned your father. Harriman came up last night too. Stalin told Harriman, the Soviet Union believes that Roosevelt was poisoned. We want to see the body. I want Gromyko to see the body. The answer was no. Blamed on Eleanor Roosevelt. I don't know if she's really the one. But he was assassinated. So now we have the, the untold history of the United States, which has nothing about assassination attempts, coup attempts, and then the assassination of Franklin D. Roosevelt. And that's the biggest one of all for the entire 20th century. Oliver Stone had great merit in his JFK movie, but in that historical thing that we've got now, maybe under the influence of Kuznick, he has completely retreated from that entire analysis. All we learn about the death of Kennedy is Kennedy had powerful enemies. Well, so do many. <laughs> many people had powerful enemies. And then, 9-11, the question doesn't even exist. It, poor Oliver Stone could never, he could never, by that time I guess he, he just, he had no heart left for that new round. But now here's the problem. My thesis is that there is a rogue network. It's centered in Wall Street. One of the people that that series, the Untold series, tries to defend, Henry Stimson. This is a scandal. Henry Stimson was the dean of the Wall Street establishment. Henry Stimson is responsible for putting the Japanese into the concentration camp. Henry Stimson is, is, is responsible for dropping the atomic bomb on Japan. And they try to save that guy as a peace hero. So I say to them, who's the enemy if not Wall Street? And who's Wall Street if not Henry Stimson, the dean of Wall Street? Stimson had two guys working with him, John J. McCloy and Lovett, the two imps of Satan, as they were called at the time. Um, McCloy was the dean of the establishment after Stimson, from about 1950 until 1970 or whenever it was, when George Bundy took over, right? And after that, that system has fallen apart. And then uh, the uh, Lovett, Lovett was the guy who, who imported the Kennedy cabinet, which was the worst cabinet that anybody had ever seen. Right? Whatever, whatever Kennedy's problems were, Lovett, or Brown Brothers Harriman, gave him his cabinet. So my thesis has always been there is a rogue network. In other words, there is a continuity of Wall Street banking power which has emanations in the military, the permanent bureaucracy. These people, right, the, you know, the names that you know, right? the Rusks, the McNamaras, the, 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 right? If you don't grapple with those questions, which they don't, in other words, if you're not willing to grapple with the dirty, messy, dangerous questions, the ones that reduce you to the status of a conspiracy theorist, right? If you're so consumed with your own cowardice to the point where you're not going to, you know, my goal in life is never to be attacked as a conspiracy theorist, then what are you doing? You have forgotten historical truth. And here's the other problem. In that panorama of relentless negativity that we saw in that, that movie, right? Everything's bad. Oh my God. There's nothing good. Um, I wanted to ask them, how about Eisenhower in 1956? It's very timely. Eisenhower in 1956 said to the British, the French, and the Israelis, get out of Egypt. Get out. And out they went. That was a good, good moment for the U.S., right? The U.S. is not always bad. And the further back you go, the better it looks for the U.S. Right? It's only when you get into our own time that it's so hard to find good things. But the, 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 the last um, part of that is, if you don't, if you're not willing to attack Wall Street and the rogue network in depth and get yourself tarred as a conspiracy theorist. What are you doing? You're left with historical pessimism 
that the world is hopeless and action is pointless. That's, I think. I think the ruling class is not so unhappy with that movie because mm -hmm. it seems to suggest that action is futile. I don't agree. And the other one is, are we going towards a collective guilt thesis for the American people? That the average schmuck is responsible for those things? No, he is not. Wall Street and these individuals, including their friend Simpson, including their friend Marshall, including their friend Kennan, that they try to say, no, those are precisely the enemies, and not the average working stiff who uh, you know, is hardly, you cannot blame it. Collective guilt is wrong. Not for Germany, not for the US, not for anybody do we want to have collective guilt. So, is this something? I think the gentleman there understand that.